and light itself is not more persistent than the stream of feminine discourse. Edwin Abbott, Flatland. Hello again, and welcome back. Let's continue our Servantine journey through history's greatest novel. The strangest aspect of Rodriguez's story involves what many see as another slip of the pen or printer's error. My lady, the Duchess, fired him, which was such a blow to him that I am convinced, without a doubt, that it caused his death. Has Cervantes, not learning his lesson from part one, now inadvertently confused Rodriguez's earlier mistress with the Duchess whom she now serves? I think not. Doña Casilda is, in fact, our unnamed Duchess. And the point is that she has a shameful and symbolic past. Consider, for example, that the real Saint Casilda was a Muslim woman who behaved charitably towards Christians, whereas the Duchess, in Rodriguez's tale, abuses her servants, whose impurity alludes to the Moriscos as well. Finally, Rodriguez tells Don Quixote why she seeks his help. Since I was known as an excellent seamstress, my lady the Duchess, who was recently married to my lord the Duke, decided to bring me with her here to the kingdom of Aragon with none other than my daughter as well. Her daughter has many talents, like Dorotea, and again, Rodriguez uses contradictory phrases to overemphasize her blood purity. I can say nothing of her purity. She is purer than rushing water. The daughter falls in love with the son of a rich farmer, and like Dorotea and Fernando, I know not how nor where they met, and under the pretext of his word to marry her, he seduced my daughter. Rodriguez has complained to the Duke, but he ignores her. He gets merchant's ears and will scarcely listen to me, because the rich farmer has given him loans and guaranteed others, and so he does not want to risk his line of credit. The reason is that the father of the seducer is very rich and makes him loans and sometimes provides guarantees when he gets into trouble, so he doesn't want to offend him. Notice Cervantes' typical turn to bourgeois material reality here. So Rodriguez wants Don Quixote to right this wrong. Moreover, she claims that Altisidora is not what she seems. Not all that glitters is gold, she says, and that she is envious of her daughter's beauty. Did you know, during the Renaissance, interest rates often exceeded 10% per year and could even reach 30% or more. This can be attributed to a range of factors, including lack of capital and lack of legal protections for lenders. Then she slanders the Duchess, who, although she appears beautiful, like Marcela's mother, her face contains the sun and the moon, she has two incisions on her legs from which she drains all the black and yellow bile that the doctors say fills her body. Gross. Don Quixote accepts Rodriguez's word, although he argues that such incisions in such places must not secrete bile, but liquid amber. This recalls his objection to the slander of Dulcinea by the merchants of Toledo in Don Quixote, Part 1, Chapter 4. Quixotic mission. What does Doña Rodriguez complain about to the Duke? A. Her daughter has been deceived. B. She has not been served dinner. C. The stock market is going up. Correct answer. Her daughter has been deceived. The chapter ends when the door to Don Quixote's room flies open, Rodriguez's candle is put out, and they are left in darkness in the wolf's mouth, as they say. Rodriguez and Don Quixote are then slapped and pinched for almost half an hour before the phantoms retreat. But wait, I thought Rodriguez and Don Quixote were the phantoms. We return to Sancho's governorship in chapter 49. The novel we are reading is fiction, but we must also remember that most of the characters on Sancho's island are acting and that most of his rule is a scripted farce. In other words, we face another extension of Don Quixote's mise en abime structure. Cidia Mete is supposedly the ultimate author and translators and narrators provide additional frames between him and us. 
But now, we see that within this already messy text, certain characters place other characters within still other narrative frames. Don Quixote traps us all in its existentialist game with implications for a range of viewers and readers. In this case, we might identify with the Duke and the Duchess, feeling privileged and more knowledgeable vis-a-vis -vis Sancho Panza. But the Duke and Duchess are just characters in Cervantes' novel, so perhaps we should reflect on our own situation. As the Duke's Mayordomo says, deceptions turn into the truth and the deceivers find themselves deceived. Also, like the play within the play in Hamlet, Cervantes aims his mise en abime at a political problem, using all these frames to signal us. Look here, Sancho's reign in Barataria is the ultimate focus of part two of my novel. Thank you for joining us in this chapter. Hope you can join us in the next one as well. If you liked this video and want to continue learning more about the knight errant Don Quixote de la Mancha, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel here. Also, you can enroll in our free online course on Don Quixote by clicking here.